there's great promise for, for ketones and for ketogenic diet, but it could also hurt people if people misapplied it. We don't know, or it may have no effect at all. It could just be the animal models and it has nothing to do with a human cancer. But if you say it has animal models have nothing to do with the human cancer or the negative effects, then you also have to say it has ne animal models have nothing to do with cancer or the positive effects. So what we really need are RCTs. In the meantime, if you're convinced by the Verdon Newman study that you're going to start supplementing with ketones every day, go ahead. Welcome to the HVMN podcast. What we do with our bodies today becomes the foundation of who we are tomorrow. This is Health via Modern Nutrition. For this week's episode of the HVMN podcast, I'm excited to welcome Kevin Bass. He's one of the most loud and controversial voices on nutrition on social media today. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Jeff. So I, I think we talked a little bit about what we want to talk about this program. I think there's a lot of interest areas that we overlap, but perhaps, uh, you know, my sense of being a follower and a fan and, and reading a lot of the work that you've done and also the interactions you've had with the broader Twitter and nutrition community, it's been an interesting phenomenon. I mean, you've built up quite a following, like there's no other two ways to put it. You've built up quite a reputation. Uh, you're not afraid to challenge dogma, I would say on any side. And it's cool to see you be a loud, singular voice. So credit to you on not being afraid to step up in and in, in, in debate and, 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 and be open to discourse. Um, but I would say that most people don't know too much about your background other than kind of the, the, the Twitter bio of MD, PhD students. I think towards the wrapping up kind of the PhD side of the house. Um, and also, you know, sounds like you've done quite a bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but you know, I, I just, you know, reading a little bit of your background and studying, I mean, you've quite have a, quite a deep history with a number of diets personally, as well as medical training through your undergrad and your postgraduate medical and, and PhD program. So it probably makes sense to start a little bit from where you come from, who is Kevin, Bass the human rather than the Twitter uh, celebrity or Twitter phenomenon. When I was younger, um, uh, I had a lot of medical problems. And um, I think this is really sort of where I got interested in uh, medical science and, and nutrition, or at least this is the origin of that. And uh, during this period, uh, I received all sorts of treatments and uh, lots of misdiagnoses. And um, it actually had kind of a psychological toll in the longer term because um, uh, long-term chronic physical illness can um, can undermine you in that respect as well, socially and all sorts of other ways. So, uh, so I that was from about eight, about age eight to sixteen, um, until we figured out, um, until we figured out what was going on, and and. Perhaps some other time we can talk about that in more detail. That's a whole nother story. But as part of that, though, at the end of that, I became very suspicious of doctors. And actually, because I was an intellectual kid, I've always been um, very curious and I've read a lot. I also was very uh, suspicious of science and uh, even like modern technology and modern world. And then I went on to the university and in many ways that made it uh, that sort of sharpened that that sense of things. Um, so I, I started out by majoring in philosophy and anthropology and, uh, I stuck with the anthropology degree, uh, about after the first year of partying cause everybody parties and fritters away their first year. So, uh, but then I was like, Oh God, I got to do something. I got to do something serious. So I decided to, um, also major in biology cause I was like, maybe if I do medicine, then I can, um, change the things that I think are wrong, like, or at least I can, uh, like understand them better and criticize better. But then at the end of college, I was like, I'm not sure what I want to do. I really don't like medicine and I don't think I can change it in the ways that need to, it needs to be changed. People are fundamentally unhealthy because of, um, of lifestyle reasons and, and, uh, all this treating of symptoms doesn't actually help people, um, in the, in the fundamental problems that are afflicting them. So the, we basically just have this whole system of agricultural system, making people more sick. And then the medical system, which is not actually dealing with the root problem, just treating the symptoms. And 
pharmaceutical companies fueling that, and then academics are sort of in the medical model. So all together, it just looks like this whole system of people profiting off of sickness. That was my point of view. Um, and, 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 uh, you could, I think you can certainly look at it that way. Um, things changed a little bit later on though. So while I was, um, taking time off, I worked a little bit in anthropology. I didn't like that so much. And then I started working in biology. Um, anthropology is kind of a problem because just like, <laughs> it's interesting. So just like, um, medicine and biology, I thought anthropology was very stiff and it had its own perspective. It's like definitely a certain kind of left wing politics, at least a lot of the cultural anthropology, whereas I just wanted to figure out what was actually the case and what was not the case um, instead of taking the data and trying to make it say what you wanted to say. So it sounds like you grew up very skeptical, you're not afraid to challenge authority, and you kind of had a rebel instinct from an early, early age. Is that, is that, would sure. that be incorrect? And it's like pr pretty interesting because it sounds like you had a really steady slope, upward slope, where you could see a lot of folks that I knew at that were so, you know somewhat rebellious don't you know end up in a prestigious MD, PhD program, which is a very challenging program. I mean, it's an interesting slope where when you're 16, it sounds like people didn't know you were going to graduate college, but now that high study school. yeah or, or sorry it's high school and that you yeah. almost it sounds like went from completely anti-institutional almost a rebel into one of the more challenging more prestigious programs within structured institutional academia i mean what would you say catalyzed that 180 there it's really weird it's like whenever you're in that sort of position where you're dealing with a lot of suffering and stress. And it happens over a really long period of time, over like a, an eight year period from the time you're eight years old. You're not, that shapes your values, that shapes your outlook, that shapes the way that you see the world. And when you can resolve that, um, then you can sort of, in my case, I, I sort of felt, I felt like I was able to, and this was very difficult at the same time. It's not, it wasn't an entirely positive thing. In some ways it was, it was very, it was incredibly difficult, um, up till my mid twenties. But I, I could feel like um, I could I could re reform myself. Uh, I could reinvent myself and start out from scratch. So I feel like in some ways my life started over at about between the age of 16 and 18 and then I had to redo everything over again. So from that experience, I remained skeptical, but I think I got a sense of possibility that I didn't see before. And I was also trying to make up for lost time in a sense that, um, and a feeling, especially early on that I felt like I'd been robbed of something and I wanted to show, um, everybody else, um, and to some degree myself that, you know, that I, that I, that was valuable, that I could do something uh, meaningful with my life. So it's like kind of a chip on the shoulder and you're like, okay, totally. I spent for 16 years of my life dealing with medical issues and, that sap will to accomplish in traditional sense. And now it's like, okay, I've resolved that. Now let's see how, where the, the sky is kind of the limit and I can accomplish in the traditional context. Fascinating. Can you talk us through why did MD, why did PhD make sense at the time? Um, Cause you know, one could say, hey, you could be just an MD. You could just be a PhD. You could be an entrepreneur. You could be just a health influencer that doesn't necessarily have the advanced degrees, but is speaking to tens, hundreds, millions of people as a health expert, which we will, you know, I'm sure talk about. Um, what drew you to MD, PhD specifically? And was there a research problem? Was there a scientific question that drove that decision? I mean, kind of thinking about my academic career, um, I would say that there's almost like two types of people that consider PhD. It's like you either kind of grew up in a system where more degrees is better and it's kind of like the de facto choice. And I think, you know, that might not necessarily be the optimal way to enter a PhD because again, it's like five, six plus years of your life in a not necessarily glamorous position. Or I think there are some people that just had like a scientific question 
whether that's a biology question or a computer science problem, they're like, I want to solve this. And the PhD is the best avenue for me to solve it. Um, so maybe a, a couple of questions all in one there. Um, what was your approach going to the MD PhD program? Um, why was that the choice? Was there a burning scientific question? Or was it, hey, I think this is a platform that allows me to eventually do what is my master, you know, my magnum opus? I made a decision, you know, I may not be able to like change the world in this gigantic way that I want to, but maybe, you know, helping one person at a time might be meaningful. Um, and even though it's using medication sometimes, maybe that's still something useful, like if I can make people's lives better. And I think that that way of thinking about things was something of a turning point for me in becoming a little more pragmatic. So I went the straight MD route and um, I did, did that for a year. I did really well in med, med school. I actually loved it. I loved med school. I know a lot of people say it's terrible. I loved it. Uh, cause it's the same grind, you know, it's like the Goggins thing, but for, you know, science. So, um, so I just loved like studying 12 hours a day, just working all the time. It was just, it was a way to challenge myself and I did well. We did so much information and so many diseases, so many drugs, so many side effects, so many ways, so, so much information about how to diagnose things that, in order to get by med school and actually in order to do well, in order to get A's, in order to get really high grades on the step exams, the um, qualifying or the uh, the standardized test that you need to be a, to practice as a doctor, actually you need to get really high scores to get into a good residency. You actually have to like try not to be curious. Like if you have a question that's like, oh, what about this? Like, let's look this up. You have to like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep like grinding through and studying all these things. So you actually have to be intentionally become a less curious person to do well. So you have to cover a mile wide, but two inches deep. And if yes. you're driving a mile down, you're going to get two. I mean, essentially it's wasted effort because no one's quizzing you on the 500 meter deep level of diabetes. They want you to learn about diabetes, cancer, whatever, arthritis, atherosclerosis, Everything. all weird, at once. Rare genetic diseases that you'll never see. Rare, weird infections in third world countries you'll never see. And you have to learn all the details on all of those, how to treat all of those, everything. Okay. So, and then the mechanisms above all of those and like, why do they, what are the, like the minute characteristics? Yeah, totally. And so, um, and so at the end of, at the end of that, the first year I was like, I don't know. And then by the midway through the second year, I was just like, you know what? I don't know if I can do this. You know, of course, medicine is very intellectually challenging and understanding all the physiology is very important, et cetera, et cetera. But you again, you don't get to go super deep on things. And I felt like that part of my um, that part of me was missing. And I couldn't see myself working for like 80 hours a week for the next 10 years. Is it because they, they want to haze people out? They want they, they want to weed people that don't have the dedication, the fortitude, the discipline to grind and, and, and memorize and study. I mean, is that uh, is that one steel man argument of why medical school curriculum is like that? Or is it like they just think that like they're going to scattershot you with enough information that some of it kind of sticks and it's kind of like sitting in the residual back of your mind that if you come if you kind of come across it, you might remember, oh, that's lecture in this textbook. I can, I can look at it. I mean, like one would hope that medical school deans aren't saying, hey, I, we want to make an inefficient training system for doctors. Right. Like I'm I'm, I'm assuming good faith from them trying to make the best possible doctors. It's really the standardized test people who are to a very substantial degree determining the medical school curriculums. And I guess the steel man argument, okay. And so to address like, are they trying to weed people out? They weed people out before med school. They don't weed people out during med school. Um, in my class, I think like one person dropped out. I think there's 180 something people in my class and like one person failed. And I think it might have something to do with what you're talking about, which is that they want to make sure that if you do by chance see this rare disease, maybe it'll, you know, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, studying this for an hour. And I think that's not going to happen in like the vast majority of cases. Yeah. And I want to talk about your scientific personality because I think in in, 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 in one on one conversation, I think you are very nuanced, specific careful. And I think it's interesting to juxtapose that to some of your reputation online and, and explore that a little bit. And then from there, let's talk about specific, interesting areas of science. 
So sure. um, PhD first, I think would be interesting to just get a level set of what got you excited about the PhD program. I and- wanted to think deep about things and that, that's who I am. So my perspective on science has really changed substantially since I started the PhD program as well. Eventually I got in this lab that I'm in now. Um, this guy is really, he resonates with me a lot. The PhD advisor I have, he, uh, he's super curious. He's super passionate about the science. He loves the, the little mechanisms and the nuances of everything. Uh, and then, but somehow, somehow even like my sort of alter ego during this period was developing for the first part of the PhD. I was like kind of natural health, kind of like the dietary guidelines are wrong and, um, everybody needs to, I don't know. Everybody needs to eat just a, just needs to live natural, needs to live like our ancestors, which is a good starting point for a lot of people. But that was my perspective. And then slowly over the course of the PhD years, um, I became a lot more interested in a lot of traditional biomedical concepts. What are the mechanisms? And, and part of that is part of the shift from me thinking like it's a further shift. It's been a long shift for me thinking we need these big radical social changes, which I think would be great if we could have them um, to also just thinking, OK, let's do the small things we can do to help people from day to day. And then that my my innate curiosity eventually started jiving with that perspective. And then now I'm uh, studying the ketogenic diet from a mechanistic point of view um, almost by accident because my, my advisor just assigned me this project. I was like, wow, he's assigned me the uh, ketogenic diet project. And then, um, yeah, so that's, so it slowly went in that direction towards his lab. Then he gave me a ketogenic diet project and somehow I've been somebody who's been very interested in ketogenic diet online for forever. And then now I have a ketogenic diet project that I'm going to hopefully finish my PhD with. It's been really, it's been really lucky. I've just been really lucky <laughs> to get that. So yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. My story m- made a hundred percent sense. It was, it's a little vague, uh, through that part, but you never can necessarily connect the dots moving forward. Right. I think that's like the Steve jobs quote, but it kind of makes sense in terms of where you get to. And I think, yeah. And I think it's like an interesting, tr- I think macro observation where the kid drank diet, I would say is one of the most talked about controversial diets on in discussion today. And mm. I would say that like, Within the sort of low carb keto community or just the broader nutrition community, you're definitely one of the most well followed, controversial voice, voices in the space. And I think people that might not be following you that closely might come off thinking that you're very anti keto. But it's like, mm. I think, quite illuminating that you are studying the ketogenic diet as your PhD as a major component of your PhD and therefore have like a very nuanced, deep, uh, hopefully, right? Like you actually know what you're doing and and, and, and you actually (laughs) have a deep nuanced understanding of the mechanisms and where the applications are. So, um, so I I think that's like an interesting area to unpack because like, I think when you, and we've talked, you know, a a few, a couple of times on an offline or on, on, on DMs. And I think you have a very nuanced perspective. Um, Why do you think, and and is this like something from a science communication perspective or stylistic perspective? Do, would you say that like people that are other people, other folks that are thought leaders or, or, or spokespeople within the keto community sometimes conflict with you or like you guys have arguments online. Like, do you think that's just the nature of social media? Do you think it's a nature of you reacting towards some of the uh, radicalism that you see going out with popular science communication where people aren't nuanced enough, not scientific enough, not caveating enough around some of the claims around and excitement around the ketogenic diet. I mean, maybe, maybe another way to just sort of encapsulate the question nicer is that like my understanding of your thoughts is that you're not antithetical to keto. I, I think maybe a place of middle ground is that there are definitely exciting areas of research and, and applications of the ketogenic diet for certain things. And that, it's clearly, I think, why there's a lot of research in the area. And, and, and partly, you'd be curious to see what your research direction on the ketogenic diet is, is driving towards. What do you think people are overhyping or overstepping or crossing the line on where you have a very visceral uh, 
sort of reaction towards. And it sounds like there's definitely something that came from a you being almost on the radical side and and, and being from that cut from that cloth and now almost going yeah. to the other side. So I'm curious yeah. to just sort of unpack the 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 academic hat on when you're a researcher and then the social media presence as someone that's engaging in the public discourse around nutrition and diets and all of that is, is that the same person are you playing different hats for different roles how how do, how does this come together full circle between the the md phd kevin bass versus the social media nutrition uh thought leader and 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 and, and almost a i would say uh a polemic or a, or a, to, to, to spark conversations. I can say that what I have seen in my life is with the people who are really successful um, and with the people who are really successful, they have really focused on building a strong social network. And so whenever I was, I, after I graduated, I lived with a guy who's now doing an MD PhD at Harvard um, and he he got there by, of course, he's very talented, but his social network helped him a lot and the opportunities that he got through that. So for me, um, that was something I really wanted to build on social media. And that's because I wanted to hopefully make an impact in the world. Um, otherwise, it would be, you know, otherwise, there's no reason to do it. Whenever people say things that don't make sense, that bothers me innately to a, a large degree because it's like, especially experts, and this has always bought this has bothered me for a really long time. Whenever experts say things that don't make sense, I'm like, you're an expert. You should know how not to say things that don't make sense because, like, how do you not know that? You're an expert. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so wanting to do something on social media combined with my innate um, sort of. Uh, feeling irritated at experts saying things that were wrong, uh, it was a good mix. So um, when we think about Tim Noakes and Tim Noakes' massive popularity on social media, I think the reason he's massively popular is not because he necessarily chose to be popular. It's because social media and Tim Noakes fit together very well. From the angle of defending nuance and caveats and truth and all that stuff, good method, like I that that fits me very well on social media to, to make, a, um, to be visible, um, doing that, that fits my personality. So I, I, that would be my answer, but I think that that's how I would think about it. So social media, you know, I, the, the context is that social media, um, has changed the way we consume media and it's changed the way we consume media because it's driven by clicks and advertising. So, uh, the old media was subscription based. The new media is more click based. It actually, before the subscription based media in the early 20th century, it was also um, sort of kind of click based, like people on the, the corner, the street corner would yell out with their newspapers and try to get you to buy them. And the most sensational newspaper is the one that get bought, which is why you had a lot of what was called yellow journalism in the early yep. uh, 20th century and late 19th century. And they actually ended up starting wars. And uh, was could be could be very unhealthy for our um, our society. So we're back to that <laughs> again. Or we never left it. We just thought we left it. We thought we left <laughs> it, but now it's now that it's click based and now it's not subscription based anymore. Where the companies, you know, can be like, well, what subscription is you're going to give us money no matter what. So we're just going to try to do the the right thing. Now it's that it's um, now it's click based. We are everybody's vying for. Uh, for attention. And so now I'm coming, I'm emerging in that sort of, um, media environment. And, uh, um, so how, is that any different from what I do in the lab? Yeah, for sure. Because if you, if you, if you go about doing things in the lab in a way that's not pleasant, you're not going to do well as a scientist, yep. uh, because, because it's relationship based in, in science. And so I make a firm distinction between, if I'm talking to a legitimate scientist, and actually I think this fits together. If I'm talking to a legitimate scientist who's who's like who's actually really trying to do real science, it's it's all good because we're both, you know, we're both trying to do real science. But if I'm talking to somebody who's not a real scientist, it's not good. And I think actually that's the way that people that's the way I think I should be. It's um so that people know that uh this is not an equal debate. So I try to not have equal debates with people who I don't think are scientists or are asking legitimate scientific questions or who are not in a scientific mode. 
of thinking, like questioning their own beliefs, trying to find the holes uh, where the people who are advocating. So, yeah, I think actually it's the same me in both of those situations, but I'm, I talk to people who sell misinformation very different than I talk to people who are legitimate scientists. In those cases, um, I try to have the best, most cordial relationships possible, right? Because that's what my scientific career will depend on. It sounded like you had some instinct that social media, building a strong network was valuable for your friend that's at Harvard. You wanted to tap into it. And it's, and I think you had this irreverent, I think, either bravery or naivete or something that allowed you to stand up to folks with authority or at the time more authority uh, to build a following around calling people out. If, is, if, is that, that's the right way you think about it. Um, which I don't necessarily think is, uh, which I think actually is like an important role where, you know, my lens on a lot of this is that Science is not an appeal to authority in the sense that, like, if you have a lot of degrees in publication, it doesn't mean you're untouchable. I think it means mm -hmm. that, yes, with someone with a lot of credentials theoretically should have the best mastery of the science, of the data, of the evidence, and therefore mm -hmm. you they they win, they quote unquote win based on the truth. Yes. But if they don't live up to that standard, I think it is perfectly fine to challenge why their thinking is that way. I mean, I, I think it would be remiss to assume that the science today is true. I'm sure back in Newtonian times, back in Galileo times, they thought that they probably yeah. knew a lot. And I think yeah. we think we know a lot, but I, like there's yeah. clearly there's gonna be some X percent of science that we think is true today that's not gonna be yeah. true in a hundred years. So totally. I think we have to have that humbleness that the experts today probably like I think directly are right on a lot of things, but there's gonna be like corrections and, yeah. and, 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 and all of that. So I like, so, so to me, I think reflecting on like how you think about it, like I don't think like the role of challenging folks, I think that's, that, that's actually very scientific to me. Science is about yes. open challenge and debate and a, a, and a vigorous debate on what is true. Yes. I, perhaps people can maybe quibble on your stylistic things if you overstepped here or there. And I think I, I'm not super interested in, nitpicking specific arguments and whatnot. But my, my main point is that to me, the, the challenge of science is, is probably the most integral part of science. Science is not like this dogma of like, hey, I am the master, you listen to me. Like if, if, if you're putting yourself out there, then you have to be okay to, for people asking questions. I love putting out an idea and then having somebody else hear what they think about that idea, tell me I'm right or wrong. If I'm right, then we can sort of build on that and start with the next step of the next idea and then sort of build up a big picture. If I'm wrong, we can get rid of that idea and then go a different direction. And um, I love like my best conversations, my best friends have, you know, have been people who, with whom I can I can do that. We can just argue for an hour like and it's a debate, but it's, you know, it's it's. Um, it's very honest and open and we're calling each other's bullshit out. And I love that. And so, um, I feel like that's the way science should be. Um, not all scientists think that way. Uh, in the end, it's, that's the way it has to be in, in the journals. It's the way it really should be. Um, but some personalities are different than others. And some scientists personalities don't like that as much. Like if someone that you're criticizing is the editor of the of a publication that you want to publish in, then you don't want that, right? Like it just, there's definitely a politics to yes. the academy, yeah. the, 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 the academy, which is maybe non-obvious yes. for, you know, folks who haven't experienced that personally or don't know what, what kind of inner workings kind of actually look like. For sure there's a politics and well, I've had many engagements with David, with David Ludwig, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that David Ludwig is trying his best to do legitimate science. And he has produced a lot of really interesting and probably important studies about um, metabolism and macronutrients um, uh, and, and perhaps food choices for, uh, for weight loss and weight gain. And, 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 I, and I really like him. He's actually mentored me to a certain degree. Like he's told me some things that I need to do better and all these. And, and I've listened to him and I listen very closely to what he says and I respect him. So whenever I talk with him and I argue with him, I don't 
we don't we don't argue in a in a vicious way. We argue in a very cordial way. Yep. Right. But if if somebody else, for example, this is just my opinion. Many people might have a different opinion, but this is my opinion. Like for for me, like Tim Noakes is not doing so any like most of in my opinion, most of what he does is not legitimate science anymore. So for me, um, I don't really need to, to behave towards him in a cordial way. I don't want to speak for Tim or get in, in, in between the two, but I know that a lot of our listeners uh, probably do follow Tim Noakes and we had a, you know, a fairly popular conversation with him. So again, zooming back out in terms of, you know, what are the different qualities um, that you think people step out of line with and, and, and why, like whether that's from a scientific publication perspective or a science communication perspective, what is that? What is that criteria? My feeling is you t have people on, you ask them questions and you never, you never claim that you're trying to be an expert here. You're all you're saying is let's have different people talk and we'll sort through this and think about this. And this is all very interesting. And I think that's, cr that's cool. That's really cool. I think sorting through what's really interesting. That's awesome. Um, on the other hand, there's other podcasts where the person hosting it is portraying it as this is science and this is like, this is the real deal. And we're having all these people on, which is the real deal. And in those cases where they say things, they have these claims that, that are made, um, that are not established by the evidence. That's a little irritating. There's another dimension that I think is interesting about your podcast. You're interested in performance and in sort of enhancement at sort of the cutting edge of what we know. So this gets to the core of, I think, a big difference between the way I, I sometimes look at science in one way and sometimes look at science in another way. So if you're just trying to eke out the, the little advantages that you can and you're not 100 percent sure it's necessarily going to work, Sometimes it's okay to try many different things that you think are probably going to be safe and uh, just go for it. You know, try, you know, take creatine, beta alanine, a bunch of different supplements that, of course, creatine probably works and beta alanine probably works or creatine almost certainly works. But you can add a diff bunch of different interventions and you can be less concerned with whether it's 100 percent or not. Whereas if you are um, really trying to. Uh, for example, make policy and give broad recommendations to everybody. You want to make sure that these interventions work or else you're just going to be recommending a huge number of different things that's going to be very costly. And a lot of those things are going to end up not working. So it's a question of where, what's your tolerance for, for false positives? If you have a high tolerance for false positives because you're just trying to eke out those little results, you have a lot of resources, you have a lot of money, um, and, and it's going to be relatively safe to try all these different things. Then, then you can re then you can recommend to your athletes or to whatever a wide range of things. But if you have a low tolerance, for example, when you're talking about public policy, whenever you're making these broad recommendations to hundreds of thousands of people, and you need to make sure that you're not going to be causing harm to a huge number of people, and you need to make sure that you're not wasting a huge amount of resources and taking society in totally the wrong direction, you won't have less of a tolerance for false positives. And so I think modern biomedical science is really oriented around having very little tolerance for false positives. So if you look at the Cochrane, the Cochrane collaboration, you look at their big reviews, they're very stringent um, on the criteria that they use to assess evidence. And if something doesn't look like rock solid, they're probably not going to say that it's rock solid. And so that's my point of view when coming to this is like, if you have hundreds of thousands of followers and you're like saying like, Keto is going to prevent dementia completely, which which I don't even think even if you have a huge tolerance for for um, for false positives, I don't even think you can make that statement then because I just don't think there's I don't think there's evidence for that at all. I don't know where you would get that. Um, but making these kinds of very strong and kind of claims to hundreds of thousands of people uh, who it could affect in all sorts of different ways you can't even predict. That's whenever I start to get upset because then you can start to hurt people. And this goes back to, to my, to my, to my life story, right? Which is that for me, doctors didn't always do a great job. And a, a lot of that's because the science that they were using was not that good. So I don't like to see people using science that's not that good because it can hurt people and it will hurt people. Bad science will hurt people. Uh, bad recommendations, diet gurus who are 
who are who are selling things they're not 100% sure about, but then they're going to sell them anyway. That stuff can really hurt people, and I'm passionate about that. So, um, so I'm great. I'm great to have. I'm great to have these theoretical conversations, and I'm, I love. I would love in an academic environment or even on here to talk about, in theory, you know, keto, you know, reversing heart disease and, every, and any illness, like being the the panacea for illnesses and illnesses and then talking about the little details on that. It'd be great. It's a scientific conversation. But whenever you start like saying this is going to do this and you're talking to an average person who's not really interested in having a deep scientific conversation, but just wants to know how to eat and how to live their life. It, it, then it, then I, that's stepping over a line. That's whenever it's not a, a, a scientific conversation anymore. If I were to summarize there, like the two main sticking points that you have is folks that are over claiming that where the evidence stands today. And I think you are right that mostly with nutrition, there isn't really strong RCT data that shows causality in for basically essentially any diet, right? Like most of these studies are epidemiology, which I think we can have a conversation around like what you can take from epidemiology studies. So I think I would agree with you that it is scientifically spurious to make direct causal claims on any diet because nothing has been formally studied in RCT. Uh, so like point one, and I, and I have sympathy towards that. And I think, I, I guess my sub point around that is, okay, but there is like interesting evidence and whether that's animal models or short-term studies that you can have some theoretical mechanisms. I think there's like nuance towards what can be exciting and what one could potentially test. But I think you're really allergic to the fact around what, which is point two, which is that you don't want to overpromise or give a recommendation that could harm people. Yes. And then and I think my, and I think the interesting point to me is that I think folks like, again, not to, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but like a little bit of the reason why I have some empathy towards folks that are more encouraging of alternate diets is the, is I think their conclusion, which I think they have reasonable justification for, which is that the status quo is like quite terrible. Like the standard Western diet is so bad that if I could directionally push them towards keto and maybe in, 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 in also just maybe vegan, maybe it's a different dietary protocol is better than the status quo. And I feel like I am generally pushing towards truth by trying to take people off of a standard Western diet. And I think that's where I think there's like a very we can have like a nuanced debate around. Is that too far? Like, what is the purpose of that? Is that turning more into, is that over promising because now you're more of a, a, a dietary guru that's based on, on, on early evidence or directional evidence, but not solid gold standard RCT data? And what's our tolerance for that? And it sounds like from hearing how, you, how you're thinking about it, you have very low tolerance of recommendations off of not gold standard RCT data, but maybe the steel man, some of the other folks, it's like, I think they have less of a tolerance or need for like gold standard RCT and they have enough smoking gun evidence around either mechanisms around, you know, insulin or insulin resistance. And I think we can talk about some of the popular models like carbohydrate insulin model versus calories and calories out model um, that they have enough confidence there that they can try to guide, uh, guide people or, or recommend people investigate. But I would I would agree with you that you wouldn't necessarily want to sell that or proclaim that as scientific consensus. But I think it's fair to say, hey, these are interesting uh, directions to potentially personally investigate. I will say the way that we're doing things now is terrible, right? The standard American diet is terrible. People are obese. People have diabetes. They could have a lot less cancer than they have. Um, they could have less heart disease and have people could live a lot longer than they do. And I don't see it getting better uh, in the short term and, um, because uh, I, I see the same thing continuing for for the foreseeable future. And that's that's it's terrible. Um, the question is, is how would we solve that problem? And some people uh who are interested in low carb diets and ketogenic diet in particular, um, will say that the ketogenic diet is the way to solve the problem. What I would say is, is if you look at the whole of evidence, um, 
ketogenic diet or maybe a low carb diet might be one way to solve the problem. But the whole of evidence suggests that, um, in my opinion, as far as I can tell, and we could go back and forth about this, but the whole evidence suggests that there's probably multiple different ways to solve the problem. And the reason I think that's important is we need all the options open available to us because there are constraints. So a really great constraint to talk about is on um, animal products, right? So in the long term, if we have 7 billion, 8 billion, 10 billion people on the planet, if everybody's eating a carnivore diet, it's not going to work. We're going to have to have we're going to have to turn Mars into a, 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 a giant feedlot because there's no way we can even have we don't even have enough land to to do that. Like we we'd need literally like 20 Earths or something. It would be ridiculous if we, everything was grass fed. Right. Right. Like just to give everybody in the United States a carnivore diet, I actually calculated this based on current land use. It would take like five. Point five United States, you know, so, so if you use grass fed, so there's other constraints. So, so the way I'm, I'm looking at it is since you have different constraints on what you can actually do to solve this particular problem, we need all of the different possibilities open to discussion. And whenever I say possibility, I don't mean remotely possible. In my opinion, it's, it's just as possible equally as possible because of the way I look at chronic disease. Um, it's equally possible that a, a, a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and I don't personally think that that, I mean, and we, I could support this with evidence, but I mean, everybody can support their view with evidence, but I think a non-ketogenic diet has just as much evidence for curing all these chronic disease problems as a ketogenic diet does. And we should leave those possibilities open, especially given the resource constraints that we have. And so people are saying, everybody needs to be on a ketogenic diet, um, eating animal products, like tons of animal products, all this. It's just, it just doesn't make sense in terms of resource perspective. And it's not true scientifically that the ketogenic diet is the only way. I do think a well-formulated ketogenic diet could be an option for a lot of people or low carb diet could be option for a lot of people or even the whole population. Um, I just think that there's other paths that are equally valid and, and, um, have equal merit that could also solve the problem. Yeah. I don't try to be dogmatic on any specific diet because I don't care what other people eat really. And in a sense, like I don't make more or less money. I'm not personally insulted or less insulted if people eat vegan, keto or carnivore or whatnot. I think for me, there's, you know, again, one of the things that I always re underline is that we have different genetic baselines. We have different starting points from where our health is, and we likely have different goals of what we want to optimize for. And there are, and I think this, the human system has various inputs and in which of nutrition is one of that. And the macronutrient breakdown is one very important yeah. input. So I think to me, it's like, I, I would agree with you. I think you could get to a similar metabolic strategy with various diets, right? I think the levers to me are your macronutrients, like your dietary restriction, your time restriction. Um, you know, do you kind of do intermittent fasting or extended fasts or constant eating windows? And as like the two main levers that you can control, right? Like, I guess like there's a dietary component, like what macros do you eat? Do you eat keto? Do you eat high protein? Do you eat high carb, low carb? There's a time restriction. And then there's like a calorie calorie count, right? Do you restrict carb, restrict calories or do you add libidum for calories? Like those are like the three levers you can control around nutrition. And I think a lot of the focus has been focused on just dietary restriction, right? Like keto versus vegan versus high protein. And I think we, and, 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 and within that lens, people forget about, okay, if you add a calorie restriction to any of those diets, that's a huge lever. Yeah. If you add time restriction to any of those things, that's a huge lever. So I think to me, it's like, you could get to an overall similar metabolic outcome with, if you play with all three of those levers versus just only focus on one lever. So like in that sense, I'm like generally open to how people want to get there. And I think people have different preferences to how to get there. I agree with that about calorie restriction and macronutrients. Time restriction is interesting. I tr actually, from a personal point of view, uh, try to practice time restricted eating, like early time restricted eating. Um, because I noticed like HRV and a lot of other like um, heart rate overnight 
is a lot better if I do that. Yep. Um, and even if I'm not gaining weight or, or anything like that, it's just my mar- everything looks better if I do things that way. And it makes sense to me. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited to learn more about the science, the evidence that's coming out about that, though, and how important that is exactly. Uh, I do it, though, and, yep. and I'm sold on it from a personal point of view so far. But um, about calories versus macronutrients, it's, it's interesting. Um, let's talk about some of the stuff that's in favor of the ketogenic diet, uh, since I almost, I almost like want to avoid sounding like I'm coming down bashing it because yeah I, I love to talk about that because i think it's like there is exciting areas of research on the ketogenic diet like that's why you're spending like a lot of your time studying the ketogenic diet right if you thought this is complete crap like i presume you wouldn't do a goddamn phd on it so like what are you excited about like what is the evidence that you're most excited about with the keto so let's talk about cancer right so i think a lot of i think a lot of the cancer models for the ketogenic diet the diet the dot the feeding the design study designs haven't been that great. So, um, a lot of times what investigators will do is they'll have a protein restriction along with the ketogenic diet. And we know from the cancer literature that protein restriction independent of ketosis causes slower, uh, cancer growth and, uh, carcinogenesis in multiple different kinds of cancer models going back to the 1940s. So, and still to the very day, present day, we're still studying that and showing that um, probably it modulates the immune system, probably makes the immune system more active. They, they, they kill cancer cells more readily. Um, and it might have something to do with like they're looking for protein, quote unquote, they're looking for like whatever. But that's where the science stands there. And so I'm kind of skeptical of not kind of I'm quite skeptical of the majority of not even just ketogenic diet and cancer preclinical models but ketogenic diet preclinical models because a lot of them restrict protein which has all sorts of different effects that are independent of ketogenic diet that said there was a really interesting paper there's two interesting papers that came out in cell metabolism I'm sure you're familiar with them one of them was by the people who uh, Brianna is working with right now um, Newman and Verdon mm-hmm. and they had this really awesome mouse feeding study uh where they fed them this ketogenic diet it's actually kind of a cyclical ketogenic diet because they need to make sure they didn't gain too much weight um and they sped them for two years on this diet after the age they got the mice the mice were about one year old whenever they started them they fed them for two years and one of the really interesting findings in that study and also it was an interesting finding in the roberts et al study was published the same the same issue of cell metabolism uh in both cases in Robert et al. case, they they showed uh, reduced cancer, uh, spontaneous cancer incidents, and there's a certain kind of cancer like histio, something sarcoma, and in the Verdon Newman case, it was like borderline. It looked like it could have been statistically significant if they had more um, more mice. So, um, and in the Verdon Newman study, they had really closely matched diets. Like that was a really well done study, and I really appreciated that study. So. And then there's actually several other studies where they done matched diets and showed s- reduced spontaneous cancer. Or actually, I think that was a xenograft model. They had matched diets and they showed a slower growth of the xenograft model. So, so matched diets meaning matched protein load, and then they switched the fat car- fat carbohydrates. Yes, yes. Okay. Match, matched protein load, but also matched minerals, vitamins, all those things. Those are usually also mismatched in <laughs> most of the preclinical studies. This really needs to change. This is a yeah. huge problem, in my opinion, is the diets need to match. It's not that hard to do. There's companies that sell them. There's professors who have recently messaged me about this and been like, what diet do you guys use to make sure that this is matched? And so there's, there's even sets of matched diets you can buy. You buy both diets at the same time. They're perfectly well formulated. They're purified from research diets. It's a company. So they should be matched. Which makes sense, right? Like the part of science oh is you want goodness. to isolate your, your, your variables. Okay, like you're testing one variable. Yeah, people have been pointing this out for decades in other contexts, like high fat diet and metabolic uh, study contexts in mice. They've been pointing out for a long time and it's not getting fixed apparently. So maybe I'll, I'm just going to make that my drum. I'm going to beat for a while. So um yeah, they did match. It was perfect. It's a beautiful study. Not only did they find lower cancer incidence, they also found um, like this cog- cognitive benefit that was tremendous. It was just beautiful. And it's like one of the most exciting things about the ketogenic diet. They can think of that particular study in both of those respects because they showed that the older mice, even though they were older, they were actually doing better after two years 
cognitively in terms of memory, these memory tasks than the younger mice did at one year is incredible. Yeah. So, um, that was just a, a wonderful set. And I'm really excited about that. So, uh, that's positive. I could go, <laughs> we could talk about the Alzheimer's research and like the problems with that, that hasn't been, that hasn't been shown. Like it hasn't been shown that ketones treat Alzheimer's, but that's, that's a really great, and maybe perhaps ketones or maybe even something like an exogenous ketone, uh, taken over the course of the lifespan could, could, could substantially like reduce aging, brain aging. That would be amazing. Um, and if that turns out to be the case, I would be the first person to be like, that is amazing. We have to figure out how to make yeah. these things cheap and distribute them in the water supply, you know, like seriously, because yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's something I'm excited about. Um, diabetes is also promising. Uh, so, so let's talk about diabetes. Let's talk about the, the, remission versus cure and like i think talk about we're all seeing similar studies and i think uh, you're excited about uh, very much i would say the same studies that i think a lot of the keto people are excited about but i think where you're more cautious and i think where you're potentially calling people out is that like i like i agree i think that's a very exciting but i wouldn't necessarily claim that ketogenic diet cures cancer ketogenic diet you know cures dementia right like i think is, is that like the main like difference. I think like the data is exciting, right? I think. Yeah. It's not just that though, Rip, because on the other hand, we could talk about, um, several other studies where they've injected, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate into mouse models of, of breast cancer and they've seen acceleration of the breast cancer. So, um, that's, you didn't change macronutrients, you didn't change anything. Then you just added beta hydroxybutyrate. Well, is that because you're adding an energy source? Um, so then you're, it's not matched in calories. Like the, the mice aren't matched cars could be, but they need to test that. And then, um, there's also one with, uh, melanoma that showed a similar thing. There is a, a mouse study where they showed acceleration of the mel melanoma. We need to make sure that when we say keto might be able to cure cancer to, to say like, we're still in the preliminary stages. A lot of the evidence hasn't been great. Some of it has, and some evidence suggests that keto might not be great for cancer. Oh yeah. And then, uh, uh, um, uh, a leukemia model, they did, uh, uh, Mukherjee and, uh, and, uh, Cantley did, uh, uh, they published it's Hopkins et al. in 2018. They showed that it accelerated a leukemia model. So there's great promise for, for ketones and for ketogenic diet, but it could also hurt people if people misapplied it. We don't know, or it may have no effect at all. It could just be the animal models and it has nothing to do with the human cancer. But if, if you say it has animal models have nothing to do with the human cancer or the negative effects, then you also have to say it's ne animal models have nothing to do with cancer or the positive effects. So what we really need are RCTs. In the meantime, if you're convinced by the Verdon Newman study that you're going to start supplementing with ketones every day, go ahead. But, but, and that might help. You might like live five years longer than me. You may, maybe, yeah. but we don't know. That's cool. all. That I would say is like hundred percent fair. I think it's like, there is counter evidence within ketogenic diet for some of these indications as well. And I think you are likely, I think have a point there where I think when people try to make a simple statement, they over brush the negative evidence. And I think that's where you, I think you call out as unscientific, right? Like, is that kind of like the, kind of the trajectory of your thinking? If you say keto cures cancer, you're, that's just- That's wrong. Like, that's been shown by yeah. anybody. And it, and it could be the opposite. Yeah. So it's like, and if you say that keto prevents cancer, it's, I think that's, if you have a really well formulated ketogenic diet and you take it over a long period of time, I think that's going to be better for your cancer risk than being on the standard American diet. I think that's for sure. Um, but does it do better than, than, um, than another really well formulated diet? I would be inclined even to say like, Possibly, and maybe even I would almost be, I wouldn't say I would be surprised if it didn't, but like, I feel like there really is something to ketones, but we just don't know if you're just trying to get the squeeze out of the extra bit of performance, go for it. But, but, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not going to be any, probably it's not going to be dramatically better in improving your risk than, uh, it's, it might be a modestly or very slightly better in increasing, improving your risk than a really well formulated non-ketogenic diet. And so people need to understand that 
first off, the science isn't clear. And second, there's other options besides a ketogenic diet and really producing dramatic health improvements. So, um, and, and then just to, just to talk about, so, 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 so we both agree that calories are important and probably it has something to do with maintaining leanness. It's super important. That's probably going to drive for most people for like the average person. Of course, if you're in Silicon Valley or whatever, and you've already got everything else dialed in, it's a whole nother ball game, right? Cause then you're like thinking about how can I make things even better? And that's great. Um, but for like nine, like resolving the obesity epidemic, resolving the epidemic of chronic health problems, just getting calories down and getting you lean and have, make sure you have enough protein, making sure you have enough nutrients and all those other things is going to be like 90% of everything. And then the question of ketogenic diet versus non-ketogenic diet might, might be another, you know, a few percent, but we don't. So that's, that's, that's it. That's all. And I'm just worried about, I'm very concerned about like the broad, broad perspective, because that's how um, I look at things. I've always looked at things. I just, I want society to be better. And for me, the best way to make society better is to look at the low hanging fruit. Um, low hanging fruit is just to make people's diets a little bit better. And, and that should be not, I mean, just to think about it also, most of the time, most people who are going to try ketogenic diet, maybe if you're very um, disciplined and like you and a lot of your listeners or like me for to some degree, to some degree um, you guys are going to be able to do the ketogenic diet, diet a lot better. But then somebody who's in the random, you know, not, 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 uh, not us or who's just learning about nutrition for the first time and just, and um, maybe has a lot of other things that they're doing and they're not like obsessed about nutrition like we are, it's not going to, adherence is going to be a lot more difficult, a lot more challenging. And so if I, if we can just improve people's diets a little bit more and get the message out to everybody, it's not about necessarily about carbs. It's like you need to become lean and, um, or leaner. And, and that's going to be the biggest thing, most important thing that you could do. And there's a lot of different options for that. Then, then that's what I'm concerned about. On the other hand, there's always this other argument, the steel man argument that, people need sort of an extreme belief to sort of like shake them out of their rut. And then they can sort of like focus on this extreme belief with blinders on. And then maybe they'll have a better chance of doing it because they have this sort of religious conviction. Yeah. And so people who are diet gurus who do have that re religious conviction can kind of convert people a lot easier. Whereas the people like me who are like, oh, I don't know this or that. Then like nobody believes anything we say because we're not even sure. Right. So um, maybe there's some argument to be made for that. Um, I'm not sure what the evidence is for that though. Like what is the evidence that, but maybe if it turns out to be the case that, that poses a dilemma for me, right? Because then we actually do need people saying things in really black and white terms in the, in the public in order to convince people so that maybe that's what we need. We need people not to tell people what the nuance is. I don't even think that's a nutrition discussion. It's also just a broader news discourse, politics, everything discourse, right? I think it is are we moving to a world where you have to have headlines and no one cares about the nuance? And I think, and that's a very distinct conversation than the science of nutrition. And I think one point that, and I think when I'm looking at the evidence behind, I think, you know, calories versus carbohydrate, I think, I don't think there are antithetical models to think about obesity, right? Like carbohydrate insulin, like that kind of the main argument there is that carbohydrate is a primal chiasm that drives insulin, which is a fat storage hormone. That's like a dominant factor for obesity and the calories in calories out model is more of the thermodynamics sort of argument. The more calories in, you're going to just start packing on weight. And I think sensible people agree that both models probably have something to do with the ultimate explanation, which is that if you're eating, if you're eating no carbohydrate, but you have a ton of calories, it's probably not optimal. If you are just eating pure sugar, but like 2000 calories of pure sugar, that's probably not optimal. So it's like, I think finding something that works for the people that are executing it. And I think that, that I think it is an interesting argument around what is implementable for people, right? I think there's definitely, I would say a lot of people that seem to have good success with the kid drink diet. Sure. But so there's a clearly, uh, you know, people that think that's very hard to do. And like, I wouldn't say which anecdote, you know, wins, right? I think there's definitely like a personal, you know, whether will, uh, adherence, 
personal, you know, predilection towards if that feel if they feel good on it. That it's like hard to control for. Yeah, no, I think it's super important. Like, what do people actually feel good on? What do they like and enjoy? And what can they sustain? And whatever that is, that's great. Yep. And like, I have clients uh, who I consult with who I give them, I tell them to eat a ketogenic diet because that's what they want to do. Yep. They want to eat a ketogenic diet. And if they want to eat an animal based ketogenic diet, if they're losing weight on that, that's good. I always tell them that trying to substitute more uh, nuts and seeds for, for meat uh, is probably going to produce better outcomes. That's, uh, we could talk about that later on, but yeah. I do um, believe that a ketogenic diet, if that works for people, I mean, we shouldn't tell people not to, um, you know, so I just want people to have all of the information that, that, um, that science can offer them. So that's important to me. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I want to move to the point around, uh, carbohydrate resistance or uh, the, the notion around remission or cure of diabetes through a ketogenic diet. I think that's an, an interesting discussion point that's popped up on discussion around ketogenic diet with diabetes, Verta Health, which is a app that helps coach people through a ketogenic diet. A lot of people get really good results from it. And I think that's been published in, in incredible studies. I think there, that, that's a good base body of evidence. But I think an interesting nuance there is what is the definition of a cure of diabetes versus remission? And I think, uh, like, I'd love to get your thoughts on the difference, the nuance between those two points and unpack that a little bit. The difference is um, between remission and uh, and reversal or remission and cure would be that with remission, um, you could take somebody with diabetes and carbohydrate restrict them, give them a zero carb diet. And within uh, a few days, they could have a reasonably low average blood glucose level um, just because you are preventing them from having these blood sugar spikes in response to eating glucose because eating glucose will cause your blood sugar to spike if you cannot put it away um, the way that it needs to be put away. Yeah. So meaning if you cannot get it into your liver, you cannot get it into your muscle and uh, keep it out of your bloodstream. So in that sense, you get remission. Uh, but then if you give them a carbohydrate bolus right after that, they'll still have a blood sugar spike and they'll still look like a diabetic again. So you're essentially treating the symptom and the symptom is a very big symptom. It's a huge symptom. Uh, super high blood glucose levels are going to increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. So if you treat that symptom, I mean, and also some, uh, many other complications as well, like, uh, you know, getting gangrene and, uh, and, and losing nerve function and, and maybe even some other things that, uh, uh maybe even dementia risk. So getting that blood glucose down, is going to be great. So I think that's a wonderful intervention to use for people. It's, um, if you can do that, if you can get your blood glucose down through a ketogenic diet, uh, through carbohydrate restriction, do it. It's amazing. And, uh, you're doing yourself a real favor, but it's not the same as cure, right? So cure would be that you can do all of those things, get your blood glucose down. But then when you take a carbohydrate bolus, it doesn't go back up to um, diabetic levels. The blood glucose level doesn't go back up to diabetic levels. Right. So, so the difference is um, on the one hand, you've treated the underlying defect uh, in the cure case and the, and in the, the uh, remission case, you haven't, well, I don't know what you want to call underlying defect, but you haven't treated one of the underlying defects in the remission case. And the other underlying defect, uh, according to this guy named Roy Taylor um, and a, a group of people in the UK, uh, it's, according, it's something called the twin cycles hypothesis. The underlying defect, according to them, is excess fat in the liver and in the pancreas. Whenever you undergo weight loss, you can reduce this excess fat in the liver and the pancreas and by reducing this excess fat in the liver and pancreas, you could reduce diabetes. What does excess fat in the liver and pancreas have to do with diabetes? When, if, when it's in the pancreas, it prevents the pancreas from secreting insulin and uh, functioning properly uh, in doing that. If it's in the liver, it prevents the liver from uh, properly releasing and taking up glucose. So it becomes resistant to insulin. So you have both inadequate insulin production and inadequate insulin response. Yep. Um, so if you dramatically reduce weight, maybe even only by 10%, so, but it is still somewhat dramatic. 
But if you do reduce your body weight by about 10%, um, they've shown in direct, which is published, I think, two years ago, that you can uh, reverse diabetes in the sense that we're talking about here. Uh, about 86% of the subjects who did that, they weren't severe diabetics. They were, I think they were only diabetic for about five years. So they, had, they weren't long-term diabetics. But they, and they, I don't believe they're on insulin as well. So they were more mild and, short, and, and hadn't been diabetic for very long. Uh, whenever they lost that weight, they then became tolerant to glucose. Um, so that's the difference. It's important because uh, people need to know the difference. Like they can't, if they're going on a, a protocol that's low carb that isn't going to dramatically reduce their weight um, and they haven't tested their blood glucose, that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to just start eating carbohydrate again. They should still test. That said, if somebody is listening who is trying to lose weight and then wants to start eating carbs again, um, wants to start eating carbs again, you need to you need to do it over the course of several days. You need to wait several days until you check your blood glucose again because eating carbs the first day, you're going to get an artificially high glucose response. Um, and then you need about th maybe three or four days before, maybe two or three days, but three or four days on the safe side before your response to carbohydrate. If you have reversed the pathology, uh, will become normal again. So don't, don't, don't think it hasn't become normal based on just one day, but yeah, that's the difference. And, um, well, there's another interesting, um, important side to that. And I think it's also an important side. It's one of my concerns about using a ketogenic diet for diabetes. I think the evidence shows that using a ketogenic diet for diabetes is, is probably a good, a good, a good treatment approach. Uh, it doesn't say that the opposite is true. On the other hand, when you haven't eliminated the underlying defect, what does that mean, right? If you haven't, does that does that itself cause potential um, um, worse outcomes? If you if you don't actually like, can that cause other effects besides a lack of blood glucose control that will then, um, you know, maybe prevent you from from prevent prevent you from achieving your maximum uh, life expectancy. Yeah, that's something that, like, I think is worth unpacking because I think a very level one understanding of diabetes is that diabetes is like a blood sugar problem. And I think what you're describing is unpacking and dis or disentangling the glucose response, the glucose spike and disposal, and then the insulin response and disposal. And um, they... It, it, resolving the glucose spike doesn't necessarily resolve your like root insulin problem, whether it's like insulin release or your ability to use insulin to to to, to tolerate a glucose challenge down the line. Right. I, I think I think it's like another way to maybe describe the way I think about how you're talking about it. There's a couple mechanisms, but it's much easier for people to measure blood sugar. Right. Like you can finger stick and you're like, oh, like my blood sugar is low. I've kidded myself. And it's like, well, it's not necessarily like you got to be nuanced about like, is the actually insulin response also correct? Where I think in the inverse problem, I think there, you know, there's I've seen some data. I can't cite it off the top of my head where people might have normal insulin or glycemic responses to certain foods, but their insulin levels remain very, very high. Yes, and yes. I think that's like the inverse way of describing what you're describing, which is that if you have a impaired insulin like drop, you might not have like the traditional diagnostics for diabetes, but the high insulin is probably not good for certain things. And I think that's where it's a little bit of a new area of research where Okay, you have high insulin but low or high insulin response but low blood sugar response. What does that imply for disease states? Like how do you resolve that? But it sounds like the literature that you've seen is like weight loss is one of the key drivers for also repairing the insulin uh, intolerance or insulin resistance. Yes, and I think that it's almost certainly the case that if you do have hyperinsulinemia, it's like abnormally high insulin in response to carbohydrate that's re that's really that's almost certainly the case that that's really bad. Yeah. That's going to increase your risk. So that's something that people also need to be concerned about as well. And I don't know if it's necessarily the insulin causing the higher risk. It could be um whatever is associated with the higher insulin. So like dyslipidemia or there might even be other things we don't understand that well that um that could be causing it. But for sure if you have excess insulin in response to a glucose challenge, you are I think almost certainly at higher risk. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, that's imp- yeah, that's an yeah, yeah, totally. But if but the question is is if if you're still hyperinsulinemic but you're not diabetic, if you um, carbohydrate restrict, does that reduce your risk from the hyperinsulinemia? So is insulin itself causal and disease? And I don't know the answer to that. I think it is to some degree. Um, is it mostly? Is it mostly the insulin that's causing the, re- the increased disease, or is it something else that's accompanying? that insulin, that excess insulin that's like, if you know the answer to that, Jeff, I would love to know. <laughs> I don't, I think that's open science. I, I, I think that's, I don't think it's well studied. Because I've looked into this for cardiovascular disease. Cause I was like, is hyperinsulinemia really the thing that's driving the excess risk from cardiovascular disease in addition to the um, LDL levels? And the, the deeper I looked into it, the more it seemed to me that we still don't understand why, um, sort of metabolic dysfunction is causing higher cardiovascular disease. We don't understand the exact mechanisms, which I just think is so weird. It's like, shouldn't we know everything in 2019? But apparently um, it's unclear. So, but it, but if it is the insulin to a substantial degree, then even carbohydrate restricting in that state situation might be helpful. Yeah. So I think that's where it's like interesting where it sounds like reducing liver fat and pancreatic fat is one of the key drivers to resolve, uh, hyperinsulinemia so potentially even fat or, or carbohydrate restriction could be potentially helpful for that but i think you would probably want to do it in a like that but i would say like ketogenic diet, diet is not the only way to potentially reduce uh in, inter or, or intra organ fat deposits that's another whole issue right like yeah. so until like a couple days ago like four or five days ago i thought that low carb diet didn't help with liver fat but um, and, and if people want to think this person is biased, I mean, just listen to this story. So Kevin Hall sent, sent a, a group of us um, this really interesting paper from like the 1980s where they were perfusing, I think, rat livers with different substrates. And and they found, according to this paper, I really need to actually read it in more detail before saying too much. But my understanding is, according to this paper, um, liver fat was more reduced on an isocaloric uh, um um, low carb diet than it was on a higher carb diet, which I thought, wow, I like, that's very interesting. Cause most of we, cause actually the human studies right now don't say one way or the other. I mean, if you read them, it seems to be the case that low carb causes, uh, less liver fat, but the more you get into the methods, like you have this whole protein issue. Cause if you add more protein, then you actually, getting more protein actually independently reduces liver fat. Um, of course, as we talking about calorie restriction independently reduces liver fat. So the human data aren't clear, but there's indications in the mouse data that, or the, I think it's a rat that this is the case for a lot of these biochemical reasons. A lot of people have been pointing out. So yeah, for sure. So maybe that's the case in humans as well. And maybe in addition, it could also maybe, so there's this whole nother question of for, for pancreatic cells, um, does a ketogenic diet allow them to gain function faster than a high carb diet allows them to regain function again? So there's indications in the Vertidet data. This is one of these studies that we were talking about where we saw remission of uh, diabetes. The, even those many of those patients are, are regaining some of their weight from after the initial weight loss, they're actually continuing to reduce their insulin needs despite no change in v- visceral fat. So what is the reason for that? Is it because the reduction in, in um, insulin demand uh, is driving that? Or like, what is the mechanism? And, and so some people think that, you know, fatty acids might be less dangerous to the pancreas than um, glucose. So there's these possibilities. So, um, for sure. So maybe a ketogenic diet might be the best way to re- reverse diabetes. So maybe in addition to calorie restriction, we would want carbohydrate restriction, but you know, it's still not clear. It's exciting. Yeah. Just to add a little bit of excitement there. I've also seen, I, I believe this is unpublished, but I think there's been some early pilot data around ketone esters reducing liver fat. I believe in really? humans. I, I need to, I need to, double check with Oxford and, and, and see where the, where the data is there. Yeah, humans are not, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's like definitely interesting science there to, to unpack the full picture there. Um, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts, you know, as we're looking at the keto and like, I think where I, we think is exciting, where it might be a little bit, you know, you need to pause to take a look at the potential risks. Um, moving a little bit toward your thoughts around 
vegan, carnivore, your thoughts around kind of the, I guess, I guess the more extreme dietary tr- trends. And we talked a little bit about the Game Changers movie, which I think you had a equally visceral reaction towards like propaganda on, 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 on that side of the house. Um, yeah. But also it's a, I think you've also been fairly skeptical on, you know, folks that are carnivore who've claimed that, you know, their carnivore diet resolved all, like all of their issues. You know, one of our recurring guests and a friend, Michaela Peterson, I think you've mentioned that you're a little bit skeptical on why you think that or, or you're skeptical on how her symptoms were resolved was just through carnivore. So uh, I want to just get kind of get your thoughts on vegan carnivore how you're sort of assessing the evidence on either and where do you think people are overclaiming and underclaiming on a, a couple of these like most, you know, I guess mo- most extreme or most fatty of, of diets right now. The two big internet diets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So carnivore, it's really interesting. Full caveat, like I've done a couple cycles of six week blocks of carnivore. Um, and, and where I sit is at like, I thought it was palatable. I thought it was fine, but I don't think I need to necessarily be carnivore for the rest of my life. I think I like going to cycles of keto or carnivore, but I generally have like a well balanced and then cycle in and out of keto. That's kind of just like my basis, if if that matters to you. But like I'm generally open to experimentation. I recently did a weight cut um, because I was doing this jujitsu competition and uh, I was like, I think I was like 17 pounds overweight. And, um, and sort of near the end of it, I was advised to basically restrict fiber because if you restrict fiber, then you lose a couple pounds from the, you know, f- from you poop it out. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I tried kind carniv- of like kind of a carnivore ish diet near the end. The only thing I can say is, and this is just for a couple days. Um, and it was very funny cause I was thinking like, <laughs> I'm basically eating carnivore right now. I-, I just thought it was so funny. Um, but, uh, I did it for a couple of days. Like what I noticed though was like I ate ground beef and I like felt hungry. Like I felt really hungry. I felt like I'd eat so many pounds of ground beef. It was like delicious and I did not feel satiated at all. Huh. Like I literally could have eaten – like I ate like a thousand calories at once and I was like, man, I'm – and I was hungry again within like an hour or two, right? It was weird. So um, – Maybe I just needed a steak or maybe I need to get used to it or maybe if I just kept going. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I noticed I felt really hungry on that. That's that was that's my only <laughs> that's my only comment. I haven't done it for like a long period of time because I haven't really needed to. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I kind of I know it's a silly thing like the gut microbiome research. Like, yeah, it's cool. Gut microbiome is cool. But like. We don't really understand gut microbiome that well. The whole field itself is sort of like Early. kind of a mess. Yeah. So so uh, so I don't really know if like not eating vegetables is really going to cause my gut flora to like go away. Like I don't really know that. And I've I've seen all these people these anecdotes of people who have been on carnivore for a long time. They have like these amazingly diverse gut flora, and I'm just like I don't really think I understand this, but. I have this idea of like, maybe it will, I, I don't know. I, I just haven't had a reason to try it. Um, and also it's just be, just be sort of, <laughs> maybe I should try it just because you're right. No, like maybe I should try it just because it would be antithetical because that way that would be a real scientist's approach. Wouldn't it? I think we're all curious. I mean, I would want, I would, I kind of have on plan to do a vegan keto cycle as well, just to, you know, Oh man, try vegan, all vegan keto. Yeah, I don't know. That's going to be very hard to do, I think, and, and t- unless I'm drinking like <laughs> olive oil or something. But um, I think like to me, it's like the scientist ethos is to like look at all the data and be generally open minded. And I think yeah. like just from a personal experimentation perspective, I think that's kind of interesting. But as far as Michaela is concerned, though, right? Um, yeah. Like what is I don't believe that story from a scientific point of view, because because like if you look at the history of people making like wild claims about things curing everything it's like people have done that about everything right they've done that about like christian science they've done that about like um like this magical uh potions that they bought from this or that you know like people have cured have seen remissions of their diseases 
doing every like shamanic rituals. Like people have seen these, they have, people have amazing stories about everything. Um, so from my point of view, it's, uh, like, like what is the cause of that? I'd be happy to steal man what I think is going on. I think it sounds like she has like, you know, serious autoimmune issues. I think it's like a hardcore elimination diet that got rid of yeah. plant matters or, or whatnot or polyphenols that have any triggering your autoimmune issues. And for, you know, but, for some reason, you know, ruminant meat doesn't trigger any autoimmune issues. And you basically have like a hardcore elimination diet that one can eat that's fairly nutritional and complete and that's kind of working for her. Like that would be like a really concise way of explaining sure. how to resolve a lot of her symptoms. And I think it could, and it could be reasonable. And like, I think that sounds completely reasonable and that could be the truth. It's just, um, it's, it's almost like hard to believe that only r ruminant meat is appropriate. Like she can't eat chicken for a few days or she'll get like flare ups apparently. Right. She's told me this. Yeah. And, and, it's like, why is it only beef? It's not pork. It's not chicken. It's like, and then you have this whole story of like, this is where it gets weird. It's like, they have this whole story of like, they think it's because hunter gatherers like only ate, they ate like a huge amount of meat. Like there was kind of ruminant meat, these large animals. Yep. And so we're adapted to that. And so now they're eating the true human diet. And it's just like this whole story. That's like, it's just like, if it's true, if like if the carnivore narrative is true, I don't even know. I don't know what to do. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. And maybe it is. It could be. It could be. It's just like for me, I would need to like for me to say, OK, yeah, I'm convinced I would need to see um, like what experiments did she actually do with her diet? What symptoms did she have and how are they assessed and all those other things? And so in order to like really be sure and be like, oh, shit. I'm a carnivore now. Like I believe the carnivore narrative. We should have a bunch of cattle, all this, you know, and feed everybody with 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 beef. And if we can't feed it with beef, we should like figure out a way to make it. Like whatever. Like I would need to have like the hard evidence. But all I have is a story, and all I'm expected to do is believe that story. And there's so many different things that could get in the way of 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 that story being true. So I want to rule those things out before I like convert to like saying everybody should eat only meat. That's, I feel like that's a reasonable position, right? In the conversations I had with her, I believe she like literally tried all sorts of protocols to find something that has worked for her. But I think I would agree with you that it's a stretch to say because of this N equals one, which I happen to maybe be more gullible or more amenable to like her personal journey through that. That doesn't mean that you transplant her story to everyone. I agree with that. That's that that's that's spurious. But I think it opens up at least to me that uh it's it seems quite possible that like a carnivore diet's not gonna kill you in a year. Like that I think has been I, I feel decently com confident about that statement. Sure, it's not gonna kill you in a year and and it could be like it could be the true human diet, as they're saying, like they as a lot of them think. It really could. But um yeah, so but but I don't know but I don't know what the long term effects are gonna be, right? Like, I don't know that it's not going to cause cardiovascular disease at a higher rate. On the other hand, I'm, I feel pretty sure if they remain lean uh, and they see in their inflammatory markers are low and all this other stuff, their risk of cardiovascular disease is going to be relatively low and probably lower than average person in America. Is that the ideal diet for cardiovascular disease or for longevity? Um, I, I'm a little more skeptical of that, but I could be wrong. So uh, it's just that I wish I wish that. Um, and, and this is just that they're not going to do this, but I wish that there was that they had they presented more evidence before saying like saying that they're going to give the diet to everybody. But but, hey, I've told people who are my friends that have autoimmune disease. Hey, why don't you try a carnivore diet? Because it sounds like, a, as you said, it's a great idea. Elimination diet. I mean, it sounds like a really a relatively easy elimination diet to, to do instead of like there's as you know about the elemental diet as opposed to that which is like these liquids i mean at least you're eating food right yeah i mean i think that to say that humans were purely carnivore i think that's probably not true from anthropological record right but you would say that like there's probably high evidence that was we, we definitely did eat meat as, as neanderthals i think that's well understood i think on the other side other hand like i think when people on the vegan side, say like, "Hey, we grew up as vegans." That's clearly not true, right? So I think it's like it's ridiculous. Yeah. So so like, it sounds like you're like your your equal level of of 
calling out BS <laughs> on, on either side, which I would agree with. I think like clearly there's been a historical record around consumption of both animal and, 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 and vegetable products. Um, I'm somewhat interested in the notion that um, potentially humans could be facultative carnivores or, or, or the sense that you could primarily eat meat and then use vegetables as boosters, right? Like I think there's definitely an interesting role for just having carbs for performance or vegetables for certain therapeutic requirements. Um, I think it's like an interesting model to kind of think about how we even evolved to the current position. I think this interesting where you talk about like the agriculture system. I think there's also like a third, a second dichotomy around what, and I think this is kind of the question that we talked about maybe before the program, like ethics and morality and sustainability. Um, was it easier for society to scale with agriculture and farming versus uh, hus animal husbandry, especially in the earlier phases of civilization de development, right? It's much easier to feed a bunch of people with grain than feed a bunch of people with cows. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of different interesting layers of how modern diet has evolved. And I think to me, there's a question around, you know, a separate question around what is potentially optimal for the individual, what is optimal for societal development, which has to take in consideration sustainability, mm -hmm. cost, uh, democratization of food accessibility. Um, and I think maybe the third level, which is maybe more first world problems like morality, like is it uh, sad that we're, you know, essentially enslaving another animal and farming it for food? And I think that's uh, that's probably the most a uh, salient argument for me because like yeah it's kind of sad yeah. to eat like a pig that's pretty smart um but i think the other part of me is like you know the nature is hardcore right like we go go totally. into a safari you just see a lion eat a zebra and it's just like i mean the nature is tough so so part so i think it's like interesting conversation we can kind of uh we can we can you know explore a little bit but i want to kind of throw it to you in terms of how you think about you know, vegan carnivore, your assessment I, I, I think around that and a little bit of the ethical, moral sustainability side of the house. So if you're a junk food vegan, like a really just trashy vegan diet, you're going to be worse off than if you're eating the standard American diet, probably. So I think that's shown, that's demonstrated, at least epidemiologically, that's demonstrated. And I'm con I believe in epidemiology. If we get into that discussion, we can talk about, it. I believe in that. So I believe that um, you don't want to just cut out meat and, and eat a, a trashy diet, you're not gonna be helping yourself. And I know a really uh, well-known vegan who who says the same thing to all of, 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 this, of her patients as well. When I was traveling, I ran into a vegan who was just eating rice and Oreos. I'm just, and because we we're traveling Southeast Asia, I'm just like. How long were they able to maintain like life? <laughs> How can you do that? I think because it was in Southeast Asia where there's so much like animal products, it was hard for her to choose her food. Oh, okay. So I don't think it's like she doesn't just eat that perpetually. I think it's just because she's traveling in Southeast Asia where it's hard to get like good, you know, vegetarian or vegan food. She just was trying to kind of eating white rice and, and Oreos. I'm oh. just like, I, I, I guess I understand from a moral ethical perspective, but this is I, like this is not it's not healthy it's like not this is like this is not good for for from a health perspective yeah that's 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 some commitment like it's scary like how long was she doing that i think she was probably like you know yeah like four weeks or something it's not that bad and that's one of the problems i have with game changers and i'm gonna hopefully write an article about this is that the way they portrayed the vegan diet i don't know if you got this did you watch did you see it i saw a lot of the breakdown so i feel like i've seen it without seeing it well the thing that i think was was problematic about it is they, I don't think they emphasized the whole food part very much. I think they did sell it a lot. I'm like, you're going to have all this delicious food. And they were showing these football players eating, like it looked junky to me. Right. And I don't think the message was there that you really need to be doing this whole foods like style. Of course they did have like one scene where they had that, yeah. but that wasn't the emphasis. And I feel like the emphasis was on meat elimination, which I don't think is going to help anybody. And I think could hurt a lot of people. So, um, yeah, so, so yeah, but of course we, we know for, I mean, we know for sure, or at least I, I think science knows with a high level of certainty that a whole food plant-based diet, like that's really like a lot of vegetables, lots of greens, like with every meal. And I think that's going to be, you're going to be better off 
on that than you will on the, st the, the standard American diet. I think there's definitely dogma on, on either side. Yeah, they're the two sides of the same coin. They're just like the same thing, except like carnivores are anti-vegans, basically. Like they're like, let's find some way to troll everybody as hard as we can and come up with the exact opposite of a vegan diet. Like sometimes I think there's there. OK, I'm not saying like that's the motivation, but like that certainly is kind of like part of the, the social media thing. All, all the sort of popular uh, carnivores, I would say, have either been in the program or I'm friendly with. I don't. I think they are tongue in cheek, kind of know they're trolling. Like I don't think they're they're just like they have to know it, man. <laughs> they know they're kind of trolling. Um, I would say like folks like Michaela, like pro, like legit have like a medical reason. But I think yeah. some of the other folks who more for performance, I think they know they're trolling a, a bit, and I think they know that like some carb usage or vegetable usage is gonna be fine. Like if you don't have like an <laughs> autoimmune issue, like it's fine to eat some vegetables, right? Like that's kind of my perspective, where it's like, yeah, like. If you are somehow allergic to like lettuce, then like don't eat lettuce or whatever. Like I, I guess that's pretty rare. Yeah. But I think what's interesting is that there seems to be. I'm curious to get your thoughts. Is that there seems to be more incidents of people claiming autoimmune issues to different plant matter. I don't know if that's because people are now in social media are talking about it, or if there's something changing in the environment where there's either environmental toxins that people have more of these like food allergies or food intolerances do you think it's more of a we know we we now people have a name for it so people can point to it and say i have this or do you think there's like a broader environmental change where it seems like maybe there is some rhyme to the reason that there are more intolerances to plant matter or vegetables totally i think and that's one of the the frustrating parts about this 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 area it's so we have a lot of people making claims, but I don't know. Um, I would really wish I really wish they were studied more because because I want to believe people about this. Um, but hey, you know, calorie restriction can help with inflammation, right? Let's say you have an underlying autoimmune problem. If you fast, right, that's been shown for certain. If you fast, you're you get you see remission of your autoimmune problems so long as you're fasting. So, is that part of it? Like, are people who are overweight like? losing a bunch of weight and having relatively lower calorie intakes. And then they're seeing these improvements. Um, is it that they're also excluding these compounds that are in plants? I don't know what they are, what they are in those cases. And that's improving it. Is it, um, that they're also getting more protein, which is reducing inflammation in the body. I don't know. So I wish we studied this more. I wish, I wish some of those people were really into this and could like do in a one crossovers, right? They would just, go on a carnivore diet, uh, count their, cal they use chronometer, count their calories, maintain relatively normal physical activity. And especially if they had something like psoriasis or something that had an objective, it wasn't just pain, but it was like an objective thing that they could show. And then they could also, um, at baseline check their, uh, inflammatory markers. And then they go on the, you know, they switch to the other diet and they do the same thing, you know, for you know, a month each time. And then if they had the objective, uh, you know, characteristics, objective symptoms. And then they also had, um, they also tracked everything and, and tracked their blood markers. I mean, that's publishable. So if they did that, that would do a huge service to everybody. And they demonstrated that and I would believe it and that would be great. But I just feel like it's, it's, it's testimonials. And then it's also like meet RX, this new thing that Sean Baker is doing where he's going to train people to be carnivore coaches. It's like, dude, why don't, why don't you guys do one study or a couple N of one studies? They're very hard to do because it's very hard to maintain that discipline. But if you just did that, then you would prove to everybody and then there'd be no more argument about it. But instead they're trying, they're like making money. And that's what upsets me is like, it's so easy to do the studies that they need to do, but they instead are just going to like start selling this product and tell everybody through testimonial. And what if, what if like, what if like tomorrow or, or next year we have like a war and like, everything's interrupted and all this knowledge is wiped out. And then like, no, people forget about it for 50 years and there's no documentation that's solid about this. Like they could change the future of science and the future of the way we look at health forever, just by doing a couple studies over the course of a year. And that's what, that's what frustrates me. It almost makes me feel like it almost makes me feel like they don't really care about, care about helping people. It makes me feel like, because they're not doing the basic things that they actually need to do in order to 
um, demonstrate their ideas, which would, which would help so many people. It almost feels like they don't want to, like, that's not what they want to do. They don't want to, that's not their goal. That's, that's why, that's the big reason that I get triggered by the carnivores. It's like, that's why I get really angry. It's like, you guys could just do these studies and help so many people, but you're choosing to do something different. Why is that? Maybe it's because they don't see things the way I do. I'm not sure why they don't do that. I don't know if you have any insights about this. I mean, my conversations with some of these folks, I think they are trying to get studies up and going. And I think, as you know, in academic science or research, it's a little bit slow. It's a little bit. Why don't they do them on their blogs or something? Why don't they just why don't they just publish everything on a blog, um, but they just do it in a really rigorous way on themselves Oh, end of one study where they ca- control everything and then they show all the data. I would even believe a non peer reviewed blog article that shared everything, especially if they had pictures of everything and then they, like, they really showed. Of course, it's not peer reviewed, but it doesn't really matter if it's like that level of detail. Um, I would be convinced. I would champion it. I would literally champion it. If somebody from their living room did those kinds of studies, I would be on social media. Like, this is a challenge to anybody. I'd be on social media like trying to help. And if anybody wants to do it and do this kind of study and then like have me publicize it, have me retweet it and have me retweet the results and help them out, like help them with the design, I'll do that. So anybody for, for real. So I don't know, like you don't need an R, you don't need all these other approvals. You can get your blood markers done at like, you know, through all these different companies. Now everything can be done on your own. You can purchase it all on your own. So well said, I think it's like, if you're making extraordinary claims, which some of these people are like, yeah, I think, I think you put it quite nicely. Like you don't necessarily need to go through the full academic IRB, get some funding or whatnot. You could, yeah, it just get an N equals solid N equals one. It'd be awesome not to, cause you'd be like, you'd be like kind of a, a maverick doing your own size. It'd be, it'd be path breaking. It would change. It would be a, a, a new, literally, I think so. It'd be a kind of a new event within biomedical science <laughs> history. Seriously, because somebody just does all that by themselves. They bypass everything. They show a really significant scientific finding and end of one finding, but it's still significant, especially if you get a couple of people to do it. And then, um, and then that, that would be a solid thing that medical science would ha- even have to deal with like how do we deal with the ethics of that that would be so cool no, i think a lot of listeners are probably of that cut of that cloth right i think you know there's a lot of folks that are biohackery that probably you know if, if folks are out there take kevin up on his offer right he has a big platform out there so you know track the data maybe ask for some maybe post a, a, a quick question out like what are the markers that you think are, are yeah. table stakes and let's you know control it i think that would be valuable for the conversation i'll champion it yeah that's just science it's like okay run experiments get data and then i think we can speculate around smoking guns all day long but if there's no new data it's hard to move the conversation forward yeah, yeah. so you mentioned something interesting around believing in epidemiology so i don't think i i think that's that doesn't have to be a controversial statement i think there's clearly a lot of people that have spent their careers studying and running epidemiology studies. So maybe maybe we unpack that statement a little bit around um, epidemiology's the what is the role of epidemiology in public health policy? Uh, I think one of the potential con- like recurring themes is epidemiology as a hypothesis generating model rather than a causal. Uh, uh, causal, you know, it's something that can make causal claims. Um, that's kind of my initial position. Like, great, like you, like there's clearly good statist- statisticians and researchers who looked at all the potential corrections and 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 and, and data cleanup to get some useful uh, associations from that data. Um, what is your view on epidemiology? You know, what do you think people might have? over discounted or under discounted of, of the field. It's important to understand what we're using epidemiology for. So let's first talk about what science is and let's talk about what nutrition science is. And I think that will really help to clarify the question of what we're using epidemiology for. So science is, uh, uh, people might've heard of Karl Popper. So Karl Popper's idea is, is that science is, um, a hypothesis generation, and then trying to 
test or falsify that hypothesis. Yep. And if you cannot falsify a hypothesis, then it's not part of science because uh, you can't do an experiment. It's just an idea and it's not a, formally a part of science. So yeah. let's talk about what nutrition science is. I think it's worth unpacking a little bit because I think a yeah. lot of string field, some people are claiming to be not necessarily scientific because you cannot, like, no one knows how to test the, the hypothesis of 11 dimensions. I mean, there's like, there's, people are trying to generate testable hypotheses based on some of these, you know, high, these, these very, very esoteric physics models. But I think that's like a very interesting parallel with at certain areas of intersection and philosophy and like finding truth. What the sci I think, I think you put it quite nicely, the, the Popperian uh, model, like it needs to be testable. It needs to be disprovable through an experiment to be considered science. Otherwise, like a faith claim. Yes, or it's like metaphysics or philosophy or yeah. something outside of science, and we shouldn't treat it as science. Um, cool. Yeah. So, but what? But about? But about like nutrition science? Like nutrition science is some of it's not science according to this definition. So. It's very easy to see why, right? Will eating a vegan diet versus a carnivore diet, <laughs> <laughs> will, will that, which one is going to lead to better longevity over the, over the lifespan? Obviously, you can't test that directly because in order to do that, you'd have to uh, put, a, put, a, put two people inside of a room. They have to live there or, or a house and they'd have to control everything their entire lives. So make sure that they always eat the carnivore or the vegan diet, um, make sure calories are controlled. Like, so maybe one person is, is going to eat a lot more calories, or at least you'd have to track the calories. Right. And then you'd have to make sure that they're all exposed to similar exposures. But if you did it over five or 10 years and you, you randomize people to a vegan or a carnivore diet, uh, or five or 10, you couldn't be sure that they actually ate the vegan or carnivore diet over those five or 10 years. And so you couldn't be sure that that's what you're actually doing. So it sounds like the nuance you're trying to make here is that although you could theoretically run a experiment to test the hypothesis of vegan versus carnivore for longevity it's not practical and it's like not and it's like not likely practical so it's yeah, like it's like funding issue it's like not only is it is it hard to do that and hard to be sure that you ha you can get those results. it's a funding issue who's going to fund it so yes from practical point of view um you can actually test that hypothesis and in fact you can't practically test most of many of the hypotheses between diet and disease or lifestyle and disease there's a ton of confounders right it's just like we just can't test anything and so some people say okay that's fine because we can still use um epidemiology to help to us to understand uh, so we can't directly test these things but we can you know use epidemiology we can use um, and other forms of indirect evidence so people say that we've used that for smoking for example uh, we used animal models. We under, we characterized the different effects of different um, carcinogens. Um, we used epidemiology. The problem with uh, the problem with with using just epidemiology and those other models for nutrition is that nutrition doesn't have the same. It doesn't have the same. Um, uh, risk associated with it. So for smoking, it was like 40 fold increased risk, whereas with food, it's like one, it's like a 10% increased risk, right. right? So it's still not the same. It's not very clear. Um, it's very hard to explain away the confounders with smoking. Um, but it's very easy to explain away the confounders with nutrition. So because we only have indirect evidence with many hypotheses in nutrition, we can't practically get uh, test hypotheses directly. In some sense, we could say that those areas of nutrition are pseudoscience because according to the Popperian view, they can't, they're not testable from a practical point of view, right? Right. They haven't been tested. So then what are we even doing, even looking at these areas where we can't directly test anything? Well, what we're doing is, is we're adding indirect evidence and we're accumulating indirect evidence for different ideas, but not directly testing. Well, why are we doing that if we can't directly test? The reason is, is if we cannot directly test, this is the best we can do. So it's not that we're trying to formally test hypotheses in many areas of uh, diet disease relationships in nutrition science. 
we're just trying to come to an under, a better understanding of what perhaps is more likely. And why is this important? Because compared to other areas of science, so for example, physics, if you're going to go build a rocket ship, you can make a theory, you can test the theory, eventually you can cut away until you get the set of theories that you need in order to build a rocket ship and go to the moon. Um, or you can choose not to do that and not to do any of that science at all. But with nutrition, it's different because we have to eat something. Because we have to eat something one way or the other, we want science one way or the other, even if it's going to be uh, not good enough. We don't have a choice. Yep. It's not like giving a drug. It's not like building a rocket ship. It's not like these things we can choose. We, we have to choose something. So we want some information, whether or not it's strictly speaking, formally testing the scientific hypothesis. So my argument is, is that in nutrition science, it should really be called scientific nutrition, approaching nutrition from a systematic and formal, from a systematic and formal perspective without necessarily directly formally testing hypotheses and then asking the question, what is the weight of the evidence? So looking at epidemiology from that point of view, um, I think that slightly can change the way we look at epidemi epidemiology because we also have to look at it, animal models, short-term biomarker studies, mm -hmm. um, all these other different ways of, of, of indirectly approaching the question. We have to say either that they're all pseudoscience or they can all inform our hypothesis in a way that isn't necessarily strictly speaking formally scientific. Okay, so um, – with epidemiology, here's the, the other factor. When we look at the the uh, and I guess it, it, this always in nutrition science or almost always in nutrition science when we start to go out like is epidemiology legitimate to admit to the to the to the overall picture? Almost always, especially in this area, we're almost always going to be talking about plants and animal foods. So, is it okay to eat meat or not? Here's the the so given that caveat about epidemiology and why epidemiology can actually fit into a, a way of exploring different issues because every bit of evidence is going to be imperfect. Um, given that, the reason I think ep the epidemiology findings with respect to plants are important is that each time we do an epidemiology study, it's very uncommon that we find that the meat eaters, the people who eat more meat, beat out. The, the, the people who eat more plants. Almost always it's the other way around. Now there's other kinds of studies that have been done. For example, people talk about like people who go to health food stores, they took all the people who went to health food stores, they look at the, the uh, omnivores versus the vegetarians, they saw that the omnivores and vegetarians had very similar health outcomes. Therefore it's not um, the plants that are causing most vegetarians to live longer. It's actually the fact that they're more health conscious. And if you take somebody who's equally health conscious, then you'll get a similar result. Yeah. So there's those studies too, that are important. And I think there's a, a, a common one is a, an Asian population where higher meat, uh, yes. consumption associated with longer longevity. So I think that I think this is the, where the confounding argument is like complicated where it's like, okay, I think you can make a fair argument within the Western context when you're yeah. eating meat, you're eating beer, French fries, Coca-Cola with it. And what are you actually measuring? So I think yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think there's like valid critique on epidemiology, just like epidemiology generates some signal. But I think the interpretation is very, very tricky. Exactly. So I'm arguing that we should admit epidemiology to the picture. And then the next argument would be since we're just trying to get the best perspective we can, we're just trying to do the best we can, then we just basically need to hash out and, and look at what are the details of the individual epidemiology studies. So in the in the case of the, I think that's a ja it was a Japanese study, right? Like I think it was in, my understanding is that it was like in the mid, it was, it was published in like 2006 or something like that. Um, do you know? I, not off the top of my head. I think it's like 2006 or something like that, like that. And the cohort started in like the 1960s. If I'm wrong, somebody call me out and I'll retweet it because I don't want to be spreading stuff that's not true. Because this is an important – actually, this is a really important issue. Um, so my, my guess is that meat consumption in that case, uh, there's also kind of a healthy user bias, right? It's that maybe more affluent people who could afford it who had higher quality diets or maybe – um, or maybe even just having a low quality diet and then adding meat onto it. Right. And, and like that kind of context might be good. Right. Yep. So, um, it could be healthy user bias in that respect, more affluent people, or it could be that people were relatively poor during that period of time. Japan was still coming back from world war two, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so, so 
so yeah, so then so then the question is, is okay, can we take that study and take the other studies and make sense of them overall? Um, it's a really important question. Actually, let's let's um, let's let's keep talking about that Japanese study because I don't have a conclusive response to that. And I don't feel 100% confident about the sort of counter argument that I made, but it's good that we're able to start talking about the arguments and counter arguments. Most Western studies have shown that meat is associated with worse outcomes. And um, there's the Eric study I thought was really interesting. It also showed that the animal-based low carbohydrate score diets, so they ranked each diet according to the animal, how much it was animal-based and low carbohydrate. If you looked at the different um, quintiles, because they had five different quintiles, if you looked at the different quintiles for sodium consumption, you'd see that there's like a sevenfold difference between the upper quintile and the lower quintile, and it was linear increase. Mm -hmm. So what that suggested to me is many people might say, oh, well, the reason that they're low carbohydrate is they're just eating burgers and they're eating other junk food all the time because junk food is, a, is very high in fat. So it's actually just a junk food diet. But if you actually look at those quintiles of so soft drink consumption, it really looks like there's a substantial amount of of intentional reduction of intake. Actually, like the, n the number of soft drinks in the lowest quint quintile was like 0.25, like um, like a quarter of a drink per day. So um, think, you know, I, I can't actually fully, um, um, I can't fully exhaustively discuss these studies in the next like two minutes. So what I'll just say is like, this is controversial. Um, it's a discuss, but it's an important discussion to be had because from the point of view of epidemiology, not necessarily, um, you know, it's not, it doesn't formally test hypotheses, but it can still add to our weight of evidence. We still need to be talking about epidemiology and these sorts of questions. So, yeah, again, I don't think there's like an evil Illuminati of researchers who have spent their career studying statistics and epidemiology are trying to just fool people. I, I, I don't think that is the case. I think there is fair critique around confounding both ways, right? I think you make a very good argument where like, I think, people that are pro meat pick at the, the vegan argument of ep epidemiology. I think it's very fair to say, yeah, yeah. like if it is a 1960s and this is like a post-war Japanese society, then yeah, there's probably confounding factor. If you have access to meat, you're probably of an upper class if like everyone's a substance farmer. So there's definitely like a, yeah, an inverse healthy user bias, which I think is an interesting counterpoint. Um, and I, I think to me like, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily discount epidemiology either but i think it is like how do you put it within the full context of the body of evidence and i think even short-term biomarker studies i think give us a lens to look at these problems right like four weeks six week eight week studies you know two years studies for verda health but their ketogenic diet these seem tractable these seem reasonable um and i think I, I, so I think we can be science driven about it, even though we can't necessarily test the gold standard, like holy grail experiment of putting up, you know, everyone in the same condition for 100 years, tracking calorie count, tracking activity, tracking job stress, tra tracking spouse stress or whatnot, right? Like there's the infinite variables of, 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 of human life that will confound. Um, so while that is not implementable in reality, what is the closest proxies to that? And I, I'm, I'm still very hopeful that there is still scientific endeavors and scientific experiments to be run to help bring us to public policy type decisions or, or, or education decisions, what I think is important with the nutrition space, because we can't just say, eh, screw it. Like we don't know how the universe started. No, this is like, people are making decisions regardless if they're proactively making decisions or just passively consuming what is this around us. Uh, and I think one of the things that why I'm excited about, you know, why I spend time in this space is that it is one of the most important things that we can control that affects our health, right? Like the food we do eat, the things that we, we do on a day-to-day -day basis drive a lot of the, 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 the conditions for chronic disease and, and, and sort of that health span. Yeah, that's why I think plants are good. It's epidemiology, it's short-term biomarker studies, it's um, it's our theories of why disease happens. And so if you, if you can maintain a healthy body weight and, uh, replace some of the animal products with more plant products, there's a decent amount of probabilistic evidence, I think leans in the direction of animal products being good. But, um, 
a lot of that stuff could be misleading us as well. Yeah, Zil just posted a, a quick link on, on the side panel here that is a Japanese and Korean study. So you're right. I guess you get you have half the country, half the population. Yeah. I don't see the years, but it was tracking folks for six to 15 years. Um, but I don't see when the data collection started. And I think another caveat for a lot of these food survey questions is that I think there's a valid critique around how are people really tracking this stuff? Because I think, I don't know if you've seen food surveys, but like I'm somewhat thoughtful, but like I can't remember what I ate a month ago in terms of like, did I eat six eggs or three eggs that week? It's like, it, it gets kind of tough to, 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 to trust data fidelity there. But again, maybe you assume a normal distribution of errors and there's some signal there. And, and, and I think, I think again, statisticians have techniques to try to correct for sampling bias, but yeah, it's nuanced, right? I don't think it's like, Oh, these people are just naive to think that a food survey is hundred percent correct. And yes. I think they have techniques to try to correct for that. But I think there is a subtle argument around is the correction. Is it a normal distribution or is it distributed in like a specific way that we don't understand yet? Totally. There's that issue as well. There's, some really interesting validation studies on this that um, that I'll share with you afterward because yeah. I, I I didn't actually prepare to talk with, about them and haven't looked at them in a while but there's like this one study where they um, they put people in this apartment they put hidden hidden cameras all around it and they actually have like some guy who co came into their apartment and collected everything while they were asleep and they didn't even know he was there and uh, and so they and they and then they compared the like, self report of those people. Um, both whenever they didn't know anything was there, yeah. then they actually revealed that there were cameras hidden so that they like knew the cameras that were there and then like compared it to what the the guy saw originally. Like the, it was, I, I'm not even explaining the study well, but it was, it's a hilarious study that um, they did in Europe and it was published recently. And it sort of shines some light on some of these validation issues. Do people report and how do they misreport and how do they report whenever they're observed versus not observed? They know they're reserved or not observed and all these other things. Cool. We've covered a broad gamut here. I think it might be nice to kind of wrap up around future direction. I mean, look, you're, you're super prolific. I think it, I, I know it takes a lot of time just to be up to speed on the common debates that's happening on social media while you're full time executing a PhD thesis. So um, what's in store for you, whether that's like public talks? I know you've been doing more podcasts recently. Do you plan on, you know, keeping heads down with wrapping up the PhD? Are there you, you, you plan on giving talks that people can attend in the, in 2020? What are the what are the big things happening in your life in 2020? Yeah, running more. My back is getting better, so um, I'm able to do more and more volume. I, I know it's nothing compared to you. I think you do like you do like you've done a, quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> I think I broke 40 miles last month, which was really good for me. I've been really held up from that because of my back. And yeah. I started about six months ago. So I really want to have like a month next year. So one of my resolutions I have like a month next year where I do like 160 in a month. That would be so cool. So that's, um, that's one of the things I want to do. Hopefully I don't spend too much time on social media or blogging anymore. I really need to, I do need to wrap it up. And, uh, so you know, a little bit, uh, I'll, you know, I'll keep doing it though, because it's my thing. And so I'll keep doing that. And then I'll keep doing podcasts. Um, I don't, I think there might be a conference. Uh, I don't know what the official title is, but it's like called like non, non, not crazy keto conference or something like that. That's what it's <laughs> going to be called. Yeah. And, uh, it's still kind of an idea in the making. And, uh, I think people want to do it in Virginia maybe Charlottesville. It's very funny because that was where those uh, those like protests and riots are. So maybe there's going to be a bunch of like carnivores and vegans show up and it's going to get rowdy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're thinking about doing something like that. And then um, I'm just I need to finish the PhD. Honestly, if in, in optimal conditions, I would just be focusing 100 percent on the PhD like nonstop. I can't. I need some sort of balance. So I'll be doing a little bit of running. I'll be doing a little bit of jujitsu. Jiu I'll be doing a little bit of blogging. And but most of the time, I want to focus on uh, finishing up because uh, it's going to be you know got to move on to the finishing up the medical training and then and then uh, and then uh, moving on to residency. It's time to get going. Getting old. So yeah, I mean it's a long pipeline, man. No credit to you for for doing good work there. So people can find you. Your blog is 
And your and your social handles. Where do people find you to, to stay they stay in touch? So my blog is Nutritional Revolution. That's like nutrition all and so A L Nutritional Revolution with an R dot uh, org, not dot com dot org. And then the uh, Twitter handle is uh, Kevin in Bass and. Uh, yeah, come find me on Twitter. Ask questions. If you want to do N of ones and get some ideas about how to do them, that would be great. And if you want to talk nutrition, um, comment, it would be awesome. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. No, it was a fun conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. If you're interested to learn more about HVMN, visit www.hvmn.com pod. Thank you for tuning in.